Hello, siblings in Christ. Woohoo! Thank you for joining us for Bible study. We're so delighted that you are here with us on whatever platform that you choose to listen or watch Bible study. Today we are looking at Sunday, October 10, 2021, uh, lectionary 28, year B. And uh, I put a little picture of a camel trying to make it through the eye of a needle uh, on our bulletin this week. It's kind of a fun little graphic. I'll read the introduction to you and then we will spin out right into the text. So dust off your Bibles, try to find Amos. We'll tell you where and what chapter in a minute here, but um, that's in the Older Testament. Then we're going to spend some time in the Psalms, Hebrews, and in Mark. So lots of stuff. Buckle up. Here we go. A rich man who comes to ask Jesus what he should do to inherit eternal life is a good man, sincere in his asking. Mark's gospel is alone in saying that Jesus looked on him and loved him out of love, not as judgment. Jesus offers him an open door to life. Sell all that you own and give it to the poor. Our culture bombards us with this message that we'll be, that we will find life by consuming. Our assemblies counter this message with the invitation to find life by divesting for the sake of the other. All right. So Amos uh, chapter four. Five, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Which is in amongst the prophets toward the end of the uh, well, Older Testament. Um, and can I just share it? So one of the things that I had my confirmation students do last year was learn the names of the books of the Bible. Um, and I learned two songs when I was a very young person that I can continue to recite for whatever reason, because those are the things that stick in your head. And I had one of those kids come up to me on Wednesday at confirmation after not seeing them for a year and a half. And they're like, can I recite the books of the Bible for you, though? Is that like a requirement this year so I can just get that taken care of? And they did. And they got it. And it was lovely. And they will now forever remember how to get to Amos in their Bible. Um, because I still roll through that in my head to try to figure out where in relation to Jonah and the Psalms it is so that I can find it. It's not a very long book in the old, te old testament but it's there and if you, you would like to learn it uh, no i won't it's very long but you can listen <laughs> to it because it is on our youtube channel so if you go to all saints lutheran church cottage grove on youtube and look up um books of the old testament guess what you will find there you will find a lovely video of me singing the books of the old testament it's very exciting that's awesome you can also learn the New Testament if you haven't learned that yet. That's a good thing. Anyway, though, Amos. Um, Sundays and Seasons intro reads, Amos was a herdsman. The Hebrew word is sheep breeder here, which I think is interesting as well. By profession and a prophet by God's call. During a time of great prosperity in the northern kingdom of Israel, the prophet speaks to the wealthy upper class. He warns his listeners that fulfilling God's demand for justice brings blessing while corruption and oppression incur God's wrath. So the reading uh, is Amos chapter 5, verses 6 through 7, and then 10 through 15. Amos writes, Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves at the gate. And they abhor, abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from the levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, just as you have said. Hate the evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. All right. So... Some background on Amos. First of all, Amos is a delightful little book. Um, but if you ever sit down to just try and read it, 
you probably won't love it because it's written in a super strange way. And I, I don't even know, Pastor Rebecca, you probably know like the the fancy word for how it's written. Um, but it just, it's, it's kind of difficult to read because it's not written in a way that we like typically read things. No. Um, it's a geographical circle that no yeah. one understands to start out with. You just, and then you, all those yeah. fun things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of good content in Amos, but the way that it is written, uh, oh. it's, it's almost like written as poetry. It's not poetry, but it's, it's written in kind of these blocks. Or at least that's yeah. the way that some of the translations block it out. And so it feels just, it feels disjointed and repetitive and anyway, but it's, it's got a lot of good content. So it's an excellent book to study, but perhaps not the greatest book in the world for like meditation and devotion. I don't know. Anyway, I like it. So we're going to dig into it. Amos um, is a gentleman. He's from Judah, the Southern kingdom, but he is prophesying in and against Israel, the Northern kingdom. So Right off the bat, like that's fun because you have, it would basically be like the president. I mean, think about it in the sense of like the president of Mexico standing uh, in the White House yelling at the president of the United States, right? Like that would not play well, right? But that's, I mean, that's the general idea is that you've got someone from one kingdom who is yelling at the people of another kingdom about how they are acting. Mm -hmm. So that's Amos in a nutshell there. Um, he, uh, he uses this lovely rhetoric called entrapment. So we pick up in chapter five, but the first four chapters um, are Amos drawing the audience in. And so he spends these first four chapters saying, hey, you know what? people who I'm hanging out with right now, Damascus, those idiots over in Damascus are real dumb and they're doing bad things. And you know what? Those people we don't like over in Gaza and Tyre and Edom and the Amorites and the, and the folks in Moab, like they are all real stupid people and they're doing these things and this thing and that thing and this thing. And all of those things are against God. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we like this guy from the South. Yeah, he's right. We, we could all gather and collectively as the Northern and Southern Kingdom hate this giant group of people um, who we don't like who are from other places. And then he's like, yeah, and you know what? The people of Judah in the Southern Kingdom, they do these stupid things too. And the, and the people in Israel are like, yes, absolutely. That. You're better than everybody, even the people that we like in the Southern Kingdom. Like, they suck too. And then he's like, and guess what? All of those things I just said are not things that the people in those places are doing, but rather things that you're doing, dear Israel. Maybe you should stop doing that because you're all going to go to hell. And they're like, oh. And that's what we call a rhetoric <laughs> entrapment. This idea that you get people to like come along with you and then you trap them at the end. Uh, and that's where we pick up in chapter five. So the first four chapters are, like I said, kind of weird in the writing. But the point of them is... Here's all these things that these people are doing that we don't like to get people to agree with him with the fifth chapter rolling in saying like, actually, what I meant to say was that these are all the things that you have been doing that you should be doing uh, that, that God doesn't like or things that you should be doing instead. And that's a problem. And that's where we pick up today. And he says, seek the Lord and live. Right. Um, and then we get this lovely verse seven which says you turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground, which there's this beautiful parallel of justice and righteousness that exists throughout the prophets. Um, and, and it just becomes this mantra of the prophets, mainly when God has a problem with what the people are doing. Um, hey, you should be doing justice and righteousness, but you are not, right? Um, and so if you don't know what wormwood is, it's this super, super bitter plant like super bitter plant and the whole idea behind it is, is like if you put wormwood into something it will spoil it right and so here you have justice being described as something that you have spoiled um because of the actions that you have taken um he talks about two different places in verse six or two different groups in verse six the one is the house of joseph um and the house of joseph is kind of an all-encompassing term for the northern kingdom 
right? So remember your random history, you've got the 12 tribes of Israel and they kind of split up into the Northern and Southern kingdom. Two of those tribes are Manasseh and Ephraim. And they kind of get, they, they're talked about simultaneously with the house of Joseph. So whenever you hear that the tribe of uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, think house of Joseph and vice versa. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the people of the Northern kingdom, basically. Um, and then uh, we read, seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with, with no one to quench it. Bethel is a place of worship. Um, and throughout Amos, we hear um, cries against these places of worship, not because necessarily of their locations, but because people are going to them mm -hmm. and talking the talk and worshiping and doing all this stuff. But then that's not translating into walking the walk. It's not translating into them doing the things that they say that they're doing when they're in the places of worship. Mm -hmm. right? So an, an, another place where Amos is crying out against a space, but not because of the space, but instead because of what the space supposed to, is supposed to represent that the people are not taking into their lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. Integrity. Integrity, right? They are not um, enacting justice and righteousness in the world after they go to worship. And for Amos, yeah. that's a problem, right? And so he has a deep concern for the plight of widows and children and other people who are vulnerable. Um, we read, like I said, he's a, he's a herdsman by profession, right? So he spends a lot of time in the marketplaces and he sees the injustice that is happening there. He watches people take advantage um, in the marketplaces, um, not listen and, and, and live lives of integrity uh, after worshiping. Um, and he also speaks out against the courts and how they don't enact justice in the land. And so uh, he becomes this voice of those who are oppressed uh, throughout his prophesying. Um, the next thing that I want to bring our attention to is this uh, language about gate. So the word gate shows up three times in this text, in verse 10, in verse 12, and in verse 15. Um, and that's kind of a weird thing to bring up, except that historically, the gate is not just like a place where you enter this giant walled city. It is also the place where people gather. It's like this lovely gather, like everybody hangs out at the gate. It's like the local watering hole. Um, and importantly, it is the place where um, elders of the community would gather to pass judgment, right? They would, they would speak to one another. They would hear cases. They would... Um, discern what what needed to be discerned and then they would render judgment and settle disputes between people at the gate and so in these three spaces we have um this language of hating the one who reproves at the gate so you come to the gate seeking something and they tell you something and you don't like it and so they ignore it right so you have the the ignoring of justice that has been passed down um and then we have uh, afflicting the righteous who take a bribe and push aside the needy at the gate in verse 12, because because this was a gathering place, a lot of the community's poorest would gather at the gate to seek alms. Um, and instead of caring for those people as you gathered at the gate, they would be ignored, right? Another issue. And then the third spot um, is about establishing justice at the gate. Um, and at, at this point, he's also crying out against those folks um, those elders of the community who are supposed to be enacting justice, but are instead taking bribes to not enact justice. And how the system that has been set up is corrupt because of that. And so we have this, this sh relatively short chunk of Amos here, um, but in it is, is packed all of this beautiful and frightening and and really convicting language about economic inequalities and tax structures for the poor versus the rich and uh, provision for the needy and our communities and about leaders who provide care or who ignore the needs of their communities and it ends with these these I mean the whole the whole text is a threat right that like judgment is coming upon you who do not follow the words of the Lord um but it ends with a little bit of hope. Verses 14 and 15, um, there's this reminder that prophetic speech is not about a foretelling of things to come. In the sense that just because Amos has said 
y'all in trouble doesn't mean that y'all are going to be in trouble if you don't change your ways, right? Think to Jonah, three days and Nineveh will fall, right? He cries through the city, but then they, they get their act together and Nineveh doesn't fall. Right? So he's, he's giving them this opportunity for hope that if they seek good and not evil, they may live. That if they hate evil and love good and establish justice at the gate, um, that it may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the, the house of Israel or the house of Joseph. Um, they give him this hope. Now, the problem is, is that shortly after this, the kingdom of Israel is destroyed by the Assyrians. They come in, they conquer the northern kingdom, they scatter the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. Um, they become these lost tribes that are never heard from or seen from again. They go into exile and, and it's gone, right? And so we know the decision that Amos's audience made. And that was to not listen. So the warning becomes, the, the words for us, I think, today become, where do we see these economic inequalities? Where do we see these um, structures and, and things that exist in the world that are unjust, that are not righteous, and what are we going to do about them so as to not follow in the footsteps of those folks who came before us and heard these words as well. That's it. That's what I got today. That's Thank my, you. That, that's that's, that's circle, it. I mean, that's just a, a tiny little portion. Of, this is... Uh, um, friends, this is exactly why we're not including Amos in the actual worship service this coming Sunday, because it's complicated. It's great. It's important. I think the historical context is always interesting. Pastor Tenor did an amazing job with it. But you can't unpack that in eight minutes with all the additional texts that we have rolling out here. So just consider it like a bonus sermon that you just got from Pastor Tanner. And go and read it, but like, read it, read it with a commentary or something. Don't just read it on your own. It's weird. But yeah, find a nice rabbi. What do you say, Pastor Rebecca? <clears throat> that circle of geography was fantastic. Exactly here, 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 and here, and yeah. you, and you. But yeah. the really, really important thing you said, Tanner, and please, thank you. Um, the prophecy is a prophecy. It's a sign of warning and a sign of hope. It is not a foretelling of the future. Yes. Yes, the Assyrians came. At that point, they didn't know who that was that was coming. That was the first of the predictions. But too many people read prophecy as if, oh, now I understand when the end of the world will be. Or now I understand when such and so and what war will be. No. Tanner, thank you. Yeah, Please repeat that a hundred times. It's not, what this it's is not about. prescriptive. Thank you. It's not prescriptive. So, I, I mean, just to, to continue to echo that, when you hear people around you today saying that, oh, there are things that are happening around us right now that really say, like, oh, I think that this is the foretelling of prophecy, you, you say to them, no, that's not what prophecy is about. And let me tell you about Amos and Jonah and the other dozen or so prophets who said that that's not what it's about. Thank you. And then tell Please them to turn that. off their the weird bunches. podcasts and radio stations and, I don't know, maybe just do something else for a little bit. It's nice outside. Go hang out outside for a little while. Prophecy as a warning leading towards hope, not prescriptive or foretelling. As, absolutely. Yeah. And it's always Thank leading you. towards hope. It's always for yes. hope. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, Pastor Rebecca, why don't you lead us through Psalm 90, verses, verses 12 through 17. Nope. Oh, for Pete's sake, you got to keep it short. I this got is... it under eight minutes, but... Oh, my word. You cannot read Psalm 90 Lord have mercy. without the title and the first four verses that explain what's going on. Psalm 90 has a title that is unique in the entire Psalter which is that book of 150 Psalms, and without setting it in context, makes no sense. They're pretty words. They're pretty Where's words. Where's the frog? The frog, no, 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 no. This Psalm is about time. It's about before the mountains and before um, Israel and about one of Christianity's most famous Psalms, songs, but you can't get any of that 
with the very pretty words that answer the very complicated time-oriented words in the middle. So I will read Psalm 90. I'll leave out a number of verses. I feel the like we need to have more prayer. props. Oh. You know, like she always has a prop, like, like Vicar Michael here, and Tanner. We should, we should have more props. The cuckoo clock is a prop because this psalm is about time. And unfortunately, it cuckooed at the wrong time. That is a very nice plant. I like yes. that plant. Poor plant. Right, read the psalm. Okay, go. <laughs> Psalm 90. Read only missing verses 5 through 11. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before ever the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. Verses 12, Pastor Jules. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many days as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and prosper us for the work of our hands. Prosper us for the work of our hands. The human condition is devastated without the hope in our God, as was brought up by Amos, and is for real. And this psalm, the reason Moses, the man of God, is important, is most of the psalms are said in the context of David, and David's kingdom, and the exile, and the second exile, and this one goes way back to the very beginning of time, to the utter and absolute dependence on the Lord our God, God, humanity fails, humanity falls. The wrath of God is very much in the middle verses. I did not read, but the hope is in God and creation and the prayer of the man Moses for the people before ever the complications of kingdom or temple or power or David or all that stuff. So this is a psalm about time and the cuckoo cuckooed when you were talking, Tanner, so it's not going to cuckoo, but the cuckoo clock is setting the time in the background just behind my head. That's one of the props, but it's very quiet. Okay. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Isaac Watts used the entirety of this psalm to sing a praise to God in his own words. This is the only place that Moses is brought up in all 150 Psalms. And who better to cry out to God for patience and for help than the one who led that cranky people through the wilderness, through the desert, through all of the complaints and turn them again and again and again to the Lord their God. As McCann says, this is the theological heart of the entire book of Psalms. And who better to pray that than Moses, long before David and the rest. Every verse in this psalm, except the last two, concentrates on time and what happens in time. But turning back ever again, using Moses, and then, of course, looking at Jesus. Jesus, who turned back and gave God all credit, said we would find out all hope when we turned our lives over to God, as he himself did. How long, O oh Lord, how long? And God, our hope, our salvation, our eternal home. All done. It's a pretty psalm, but you need all of the verses. And I left out six. And you're okay? Oh, I am. I've got the cuckoo clock ticking time in the background. God's in charge of time. <laughs> all right, Vicar Michael. Uh, folks, if you did not get a chance to listen to his sermon this last week, I'd love for you to circle back and and hear that either on YouTube, on our Facebook uh, page, or on a 
podcast platform, whatever uh, you might use for that, Spotify, iTunes, etc. So uh, well done on that. That was a, a complicated text and <laughs> oh yeah. Whew. So Second reading is Hebrews. What do you Thank have you. to share for uh, us? Our reading from Hebrews is going to be chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Uh, the Sunday in Seasons intro I will begin with, and then I will read it and uh, hopefully give some encouraging thoughts and get some ideas going. We cannot hide our thoughts, desires, and actions from God, to whom we are completely accountable. Nevertheless, Jesus understands our human weakness and temptations because he also experienced them. Therefore, we can approach the throne of grace to receive divine mercy from Christ. And our reading. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who, is every, who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When I first read this, I kind of immediately had a couple of thoughts. The first of that being with the cutting and two-edged sword having to do with surgery and the medical process that we have to heal and cure also thinking then of God as the ultimate creator, healer, and person who can cure us and heal us. But then I also had the image of, and hopefully you've avoided this in all your, your years, but if you've ever had to put on the hospital gown, which has the open back and the ties that really provide barely any humility, shall we say. No matter what you do when they say, okay, pop up on the table or whatever the case be, uh, it, it's really hard to not be exposed. Just the unfamiliarity of being in the room and things like that. And I think that is what strikes me in this is this very first beginning in verse 12. Indeed, the word of God is living and active. That's that energy. That's that emotion we have that God is with us. But at the same time, not just with us, but when, within us but then also able to see the unseeable, that being those thoughts and feelings in the heart. And when I think about this two-edged sword, I also think back to cutting in a covenant. When you split that animal down the middle, you walk through those two pieces and signify that we have that covenant. So it brings up all these other Old Testament thoughts as well. This letter is going out to the, the Hebrews. I also uh, looked at working preacher with... Uh, uh, Dr. Kester, and uh, kind of writing to the Hebrews are kind of, I don't want to say, we'll say kind of bored. There's a malaise with them. They're not really excited what's happening. But this letter kind of says, hey, we've got something great here. We've got something we need, and you can't hide it. Just like that hospital gown doesn't quite hide everything we would like to hide, God is able to come in. But it's not an invasive it's a welcoming piece, and that is also leading into, it really is blended nicely and balanced with uh, kind of two verses and then another two of what we get into our confession and forgiveness. And in the first part, it is confessing, a part that I think for many Lutherans isn't always completely understood within the Roman Catholic Church. It is a sacrament. It's part of what they do, and it's one of those processes that it's very healing for some people, but I think we can learn and use that as well as we confess our sins, we open those up to God, a God who sees those, a God who is with us, and with that confession, we have the forgiveness of Jesus in the second part of that reading, because Jesus has been there. 
So if I think of a surgical procedure, when we remove uh, sickness, whatever that be, and we pray and hope that works well, I also see then as we remove and we confess that sin, I almost have the sense of Jesus then replaces that part. Jesus fills and helps heal that wound with the honesty of what we've confessed. And that is why we have this great high priest, not a priest who's distant, who doesn't really provide a lot of healing other than professing and doing services, but Jesus has been there. And I, and I think of the, you know, been there, done that, but not to take it that lightly at all, that Jesus walks with us through those terrible times of laying ourselves bare when we're left open to that vulnerability of saying, here I am, God, I, you know, the atonement split up in this, that at one mint. And uh, I really find that this uh, speaks to us, takes us in a direction of looking at this is the high priest who is going to help us approach as we walk together into that kingdom where we're going to come to the altar of the Lord and say, here I am. This is who I am. This is what my life has been. I pray and I, you know, feel good that I am a follower of Christ. So both with the confession and forgiveness, we have that welcoming into heaven. And I think that really gets you thinking. It gets you pointed in different directions. Talks about how much confessing and healing is a real big part of our lives when we actively do that. So I encourage you to do a little more reading of this. Think again when you're doing the words of confession and forgiveness of that feeling. I know when I do that, there's a certain feeling, a certain release when it's really thought through and slows your life down, but it's a real active process. It requires you communicating with God and those channels are wide open. So as much as you think you can hide those things. That is where we kind of get in our own way, knowing that God is there with us. God has been through it, and it's an invitation to ask for forgiveness. And I think that's where I will finish today. So thank you. Read those Bibles. Check out the verse. And uh, any questions, you can always ask me, and we can look at those together. Thank you. Excellent. I really like the Bible. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't know why there's an echo there. Uh, approach the thr throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of, lead, of need. I just, I think that's just a beautiful turn of the phrase. But oh, please, not that hospital gown. <laughs> no, he's, uh, Michael's not preaching this week, so. Uh the gospel is according to St. Mark chapter 10, beginning at the 17th verse. The preface reads, Jesus has been teaching his disciples about what is most valued in God's eyes. Now, a conversation with the rich man brings his message home to his disciples in a way that is surprising, but also unforgettable. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to eat? to inherit eternal life. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud on your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, you lack one thing, go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. <clears throat> then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? 
And Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the gospel of our Lord. And Thanks be to God. Right on. Yeah, I don't know. Is this about money? Nah, kind of. Uh, what I've been thinking about is, is an article that I believe Richard Rohr was writing. Um, and it was Sally McFagg. Do you guys remember Sally McFagg? Did you read her? Mm -hmm. Sure. She's a renowned scholar and... Uh, Theological disciplines in ecology, economics, and yeah. feminist Christianity. Eco theologian, very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's an incredible theologian. Mm -hmm. She, um, this is a very loud truck, sorry. Uh, she wrote a book called Blessed Are the Consumers. She calls consumerism, and I quote, the most successful religion on the planet, unquote with catastrophic results for humanity and our planet. However, she also suggests a way forward. I have been struck by the rather shocking practice of self-emptying of what the Christian tradition calls kenosis. See Philippians 2, which would be like the Christ hymn in there, which mm -hmm. is that little section that's set aside. Um, Jesus emptying himself out, becoming a servant of all. Um, I believe it suggests an ethic for our time, a time that is characterized by climate change and financial chaos. These two related crises are the result of excess, our insatiable appetites that are literally consuming the world. We're living way beyond our means, our personal credit cards and, and the practices of financial lending institution and the planet's resources that support all of us. She goes on to say, could the crazy notion of self-emptying, a notion found in different forms in many religious traditions, be a clue to what is wrong with our way of being in the world, as well as a suggestion of how we might live differently? I, I really like hanging out in that space. You know, what does stewardship really look like? It's, it's about how we spend our time how we use our talents that we've been given, how we share the gifts that we've been endowed with, whether financial or creative. Um, I'm thinking uh, about a sermon title, and I don't know if I'm going to use this for sure, but like, what would it look like if, if we set out to really curb our appetite for certain things? Um, one, of, one of the other things that I've uh, there, there is this, there's a, a additional section, um, John Woolman, let's see if I can get to it. Oh, the questions that, that I think would be really interesting is um, uncomplicate your life by choosing a few areas in which you wish to practice letting go or emptying out. Clean out the garage, basement, closet, or attic. Go on a simple vacation. Eat more simply intentionally limit your choices? Do you need six different kinds of breakfast cereal, hundreds of TV channels, or four tennis rackets? What is it like to limit your choices? Does it feel free, or do you want an envy surface? Talk to God about this. <laughs> That's Richard Rohr. I mean, <laughs> I, love, I love this stuff. If someone admires something of yours, give it away. Find just how attached you are to your things. Now, I recognize that during COVID, many of us Marie kondo our house, right? Like, we looked around and went, I don't need that. I don't need that. We straightened things up. We sorted. We packed. We shared. Whatever. Um, 
but I love that idea. If I'm, if, if I am holding something in my hand and somebody goes, gosh, I really love that to just go, here you go. <laughs> like, why is it so hard for us to let go of stuff? You know, I look around and I'm like, why do I need that? Why do I need that? How is it that, that, um, we can make our lives freer, um, he also goes on to say, make a catalog of all the gadgets you have in your home from the dishwasher to the lawnmower. What gadgets have made you freer? Which could you share? Which could you get rid of and not really miss? And then ask the final question, where have you complicated your life with God? Consider what actually brings you into the presence of Christ. Spend some time there. So, uh, in my own life, I, I've been doing some research around solar energy, and it's been really interesting to talk to various vendors about, like, why are you addressing solar energy? Well, because I don't want to just be a consumer. I want to be able to give back somehow to the grid. So, um, Beth and I are looking into can we do that? Can we afford it? How does it work? You know, all of the engineering behind it and stuff. And it's just been a really fascinating conversation to have with people who are, you know, super passionate about taking care of creation. You know, these guys aren't just salesmen. They're like, what's, why are you considering this? Is it just a cost saving thing? Or is it because you're an environmentalist? And I say, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's both and, right? So, what are some of the ways that we can uh, let go and really be fully present and pay attention to what's going on around us? I think um, I love one of the things that we do at All Saints. We have these little uh, gallon bags that are filled with toothpaste, toothbrush, handy wipes, um, a hand cleanser, a bar of soap, shampoo, um, tissues, I think and a bottle of water and um the other day when i was driving i just somebody's standing at the corner and like i get to hand that out my window and, and feel pretty good about it i know pastor rebecca hands out granola bars uh, she just keeps a stash in her car for that um how can we be less consumer oriented and more neighbor oriented that's what i think this text is really getting at I don't think it's, uh, and then of course the last shall be first and the first shall be last. You get that, you get that sort of repeated throughout scriptures, like Christ emptied himself out as a servant to all, humbled himself in the form of a slave or servant. Um, that Christ him is a great uh, reorienting for all of us uh, to go to Philippians 2 and to remember what Jesus has already done for us. Um the other little piece that I had was from Hafiz, and I don't know if you all read Hafiz, but um, beautiful, beautiful poetry, and Hafiz wrote, I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy, my heart is too heavy, heavy for me to remember that I have been called to dance, the sacred dance for life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up, and to lift others up. O oh, sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnares, free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. How about that for a mission statement for a congregation? I know it's too long, but it's, yeah, kind of cool. That's all that I have. What kind of announcements do we have or any additional comments or suggestions for the preacher this week? I really like how you lifted up, Jesus looked at him and loved him, and then goes yeah. on to the complications, and Jesus would still have loved him, and one of the things that rarely gets lifted up in that thing, for who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, and fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. The grasping you were talking about, and the, you didn't say it this way, but the consumerism, the wanting more. Along with that always comes the persecutions. With great wealth come great problems. And that too often gets left out. And I love that this passage pulls that in. And thank you for your well, words. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to look at our current economic uh, conundrum right now 
as the United States and the debt ceiling and the conversations shutting down the government and et cetera. And, you know, what's motivating that? Mm -hmm. we, we can't just be the people that fish people out of the stream. We have to figure out why they fell in in the first place, you know? So going back to that, you know, how do we do justice? And that's where, that's where I really think Amos riffs well with this, but it's too complicated to do it all. It's, it's one meal, right? It's just what, I mean, here, in Bible study, you get a buffet. Lots to choose. But in a sermon, so I'm thinking about that, that idea of curbing your appetite and what that looks like. The most successful religion on the planet is consumerism. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. All right, Pastor Tanner, can you give us a quick snapshot of things that are going on? We got uh, the yeah, we got this way that's meeting up. and go so for it. So we've got um, let's see what's coming up this week. We've got all of our regular worship stuff four o'clock at Norris Square. Um, drive through communion from five to six. Come on by six to seven. We are uh, continuing our fall programming. So that's Seeds of Faith pre K through fifth grade and then six through eighth grade confirmation. Um, and then a boundaries class from Pastor Jules for anybody that would like to come and hang out for that, as well as a whole slew of awesome music stuff that starts at 530. I believe that that 530 time is just general practice for a Sunday. So if you are a musician and you would like to come and practice the music that's coming up for this coming Sunday, come about 530 and play. Um, and then at 630, we've got the choir one of the choirs both of the choirs choirs thank you show up choir. and yeah come and be a part of that um th that will all be on the main church calendar here so if you ever want to know what's going on around the church you can always go over to our website allsaintscg.org and then click events or the calendar and it's got all kinds of stuff on there about what's happening so check that out um and then looking ahead to this weekend we've got worship at nine o'clock um oh actually before that sorry this Sunday or this Wednesday eve oh no we would have missed that already because it's Tuesday never mind ignore that last night we practiced Alexa by the time you watch this this Friday um at from six to seven o'clock uh, we are going to be prepping Lefsa so tomorrow night six to seven Friday the eighth um and then starting at eight o'clock on Saturday morning on the ninth we are going to be making Lefsa so come and help out with that. And then it's the same schedule for next weekend as well. Then Sunday, we have worship at 9 o'clock. There's an internship committee meeting at 10. There's a mission team meeting at 10 right after worship. So if you um, are interested in the mission and outreach that we do here at All Saints, you want to come and hang out and be a part of that, come and join us at 10 o'clock. That's going to be awesome. Um, and then we kick right back into the next slew of stuff next week. All kinds of wonderful stuff happening. So, um, although Sign next up Monday, for 11, yeah, next Monday, the 11th is Indigenous Peoples Day, so the office will be closed. So don't don't come and call us because it'll be closed that day. Um, but sign up for yes, trunk retreat that's coming up on Halloween on the 31st slash Reformation Sunday um, from two to four. We're going to be holding trunk retreat. It's going to be a blast. If you would like to decorate your trunk and come out please sign up on our website. There's a great link for that. And you can find that on the web um, on our website and also on our Facebook page. There's an event for that. Um, we'd love to have you come and decorate your trunk and hand out some treats for the awesome folks in our community who are going to be here for that. And uh, yeah, that'll be great. Starting on the 17th of October, hopefully our fine arts exhibit will be up and running in the great room. So you can come and look at some beautiful art that people have created over the course of the last year. And then also mark your calendars for the first Saturday in November where you could actually purchase said Lefsa at the holiday fair, which is shortened this year to 8.30 to one. No soup for you this year, but Lefsa and rosettes and other amazing treats, uh, cider, coffee, donuts, and a food truck. It's going to be great. So, all that's right, what, I think that's all I got. That's all I have to. Hey, thanks, everybody. Let us know if you need anything. Blessings, I will see you Sunday. Farewell. Bye.